Well, fundamentally, law is something from which we can use as the basis for civilised dealing in a society without killing each other and uh, as the method of solving problems. But if we don't have a good fundamental law system that applies to everybody, then we may as well not have one at all. Well, the law is about the protection of individual rights and freedoms. It's, uh, the law is necessary for people to live together so that everybody gets a fair go and um, the people who are not prepared to give others a fair go are dealt with by the law. That's the purpose of the law. From an Indigenous perspective, the true purpose of the law, of our law, is to keep um, order in our society or in our communities. The purpose of the law has changed over the last century or so, where it's now a matter of parliament or government having control of the people, which is not the true intent of the law or purpose of the law. One of the key things about any law is, as Geoffrey Robertson put it, is that it's got to have a system of law which has inherent in it that a citizen can defeat the government if necessary. We now have a system of law in which the citizen can't defeat the government and which the, the system has been rigged to ensure that the citizen can't beat the government. My understanding it started in 1973 when a gentleman, Frank Cunningham, was travelling, uh, ma making one of his many trips between Australia and, New and the UK. He worked in a sort of a very official um, government capacity. He was travelling on an Australian passport in which the Queen instructed people to give him various assistances and when he got there he was told go and get in the aliens queue you belong over there and he produced the passport and they said we don't care what your passport says you go and belong over there. All his previous um, journeys there when he arrived in, in, at Heathrow he lined up under British subjects and went down that queue through passport control. What happened on this occasion, in 1973, was he was put into the alien queue. Um, despite much protesting, um, he couldn't do much about it. Unbeknownst to him, the, the UK Parliament had, uh, had just passed the Immigration, Asylum and Amendment Act of 1973, which made all Australian citizens no longer British subjects. When he came back to Australia, and then he is a mathematical physicist of great note, he spoke to a number of his colleagues, including a number of senior QCs. And they said, oh yes, the law is, in fact, uh, the fundamental law is the Constitution. He said, well, what's that? In legal terms. And they said, oh, well, it's an English law. He said, well, hang on, how can we be under a law, and yet they're telling us we're aliens under that same law? There's something crazy going on here, and he started to dig. On his return from the UK, uh, he sought legal advice from, from some of his many friends, and I, I understand one he went to was Colin Howard, who was the Hearn Professor of Constitutional Law at Melbourne University. Um, after some discussion and research, uh, my understanding is that Colin Howard informed him that, well, you know, the Constitution's not valid. Continuing the research, Frank went and saw the secretaries of the Treasury and also the Prime Minister's Department. And my understanding, his, the response he got was, well, it was about, we, we realised someone eventually would find out. So that they were, they were well aware of the illegal basis of it. They then set about developing um, further research and also talking to politicians because at the end of the day they thought that what, it has to be corrected, the way to correct it is to get a political solution. So they dealt with politicians. My understanding is that during the crisis events of 75, Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser, the Governor General were aware of this research and this information. Going through the 80s even it was discussed with uh, Bob Hawke, Paul Keating. Uh, it was Keating's suggestion that yes it should be um, put in front of the people and the way to do that was by way of referendum which was eventually held in 1999. Now what we did is we decided we'd set out firstly just to get the facts out into the public to say to the people hang on what is this that you're obeying what is this law that you're obeying 
What's its source? What's its origin? What's its authority? And do you still accept it? Now, the government got the wind of this, and so they ran the Republic debate in November 1999. Most people tend to think that that debate was about the Republic question as whether or not we had a, a, uh, an Australian head of state. In fact, the real question was question two, the so-called preamble question. The system that was presented to the elector was presented via a booklet called the Yes and No booklet, which set out the, what was to happen with the referendum, what the referendum question was, and the two options, which was the Republican option and what we might call the monarchist option. Uh, the monarchist option was, of course, only part of the Constitution, Section 9 only of the original Constitution Act. The so-called preamble question contains a clause which says we the Australian people commit ourselves to this constitution. It is the first and only vote ever taken of the entire Australian people about the constitution by which we're governed. And by 60.66% to 39.34% the people said no. So uh, people were told in that booklet if they voted yes, they would be voting for the, re for the Republic. And if they voted no, they'd be voting for Section 9 only of the Constitution. So the fact that the no vote got up uh, reinforces the government's position that only Section 9 of the Constitution applies. And I believe in 10 or 20 years' time, that'll be the proposition they'll put to the people that, you know, Australia voted on it in 1999 and they accepted only Section 9 as being the Constitution, when in fact it's not. The Constitution that we have in Australia is Clause 9 of a United Kingdom Act passed in July 1900. The first eight clauses, or the so-called uh, covering clauses. Clause 8 of that describes the Commonwealth as a self-governing colony. And for the purposes of law, that's what it remains. Now in the 21st century, that's just no longer valid. Trick or treaty, Commonwealth power to make and implement treaties. It was a report by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Reference Committee published in November 1995. It says quite clearly that on signing the Treaty of Peace and becoming a member of the International Labour Organisation, we were a sovereign na Australia was a sovereign nation from then. Um, it also refers to uh, the Imperial War Conference held in 1917. And it was decided at that meeting, resolution number nine refers to that come the end of hostilities, they will have a special conference to sort out the constitutional uh, arrangements with the, with the dominions because they were saying that they should be treated equally at that point in time. And this is borne out in 1921, in 1926, in 1931, and so on. And one of the rules of becoming a member of the United Nations is that you must be an independent, sovereign nation. That means you cannot be ruled, regulated or influenced by any other sovereign nation such as England. What the Australian government should have done on that exact day, within minutes of that documentation being accepted from England, is they should have instituted the replacement legal systems for Australia and they did no such thing. In 1998, there was a further development. I think the various people in Melbourne realised that the politicians weren't going to give them uh, an adequate forum to have these issues ventilated. So they thought the opportunity would be, OK, we get some cases going, we get them into the High Court, and the, and the politicians aren't prepared to fix it, but the judiciary put it in front of them, uh, them being honest people, we would expect them to fix the problem, at least make the politicians aware they have a major issue legally for the legal basis of law in this country. 
The theory is that the courts are independent of government, but I think that's long proven not to be the case. This is the first time these issues were put before the highest legal body uh, in Australia. The first time the High Court had the opportunity to view these issues, uh, it was by way of a, an application, a Section 40 lift application from a lower court, and the decision is Jose versus the ASIC, which was handed down, I think, 12th of December. It was dealt with on the 12th of December, 1998. And what Justice Haynes said in that um, meeting was that he had a duty to protect the system. We felt a bit cheated by that because we thought he was there to interpret the law and apply the law correctly. That apparently was, appeared to be secondary to preserving the system. I think clearly the Australia Act, in the way that it uh, enacts Australia as a separate um, nation and separating from England, has logistical and legal problems in that any changes to a constitution requires a referendum in this country. And clearly uh, the Australia Act does change the constitution, in fact it changes the heads of the constitution, and that was done without a referendum, and on that basis I would think that it was illegal. As an Indigenous Australian I have a very cynical viewpoint of the Australia Act and why it came about in 1986. When one looks from an international perspective um, at how the law's gone for Indigenous peoples, you can see that in 1982 the Canadian Indians went to the Privy Council on the issue of treaty rights and the assertion of joint sovereignty. The Privy Council found in their favour, and as a, as a um, consequence of that particular case, the Canadian government were forced to recognise joint sovereignty, domestic nation status, um, and in fact constitutionalised it through section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. The 1986 Australia Act conveniently cut off any connection to that higher authority for Indigenous Australians. So, in my view, there was more to the Australia Act than to give us independence as a country. There's actually three elements of, of what you need to show legally um, at sovereignty to be able to claim occupation, which is how this country was claimed. And they are, firstly, terra nullius, which we all, we've all heard about, the other one is uh, effective control, and the third being um, a will and intention to act as sovereign peoples. Uh, Captain James Cook, when he arrived uh, to charter the land and waters of uh, the continent of Australia, had instructions, specific instructions from the Imperial Crown and the British Admiralty, uh, only to do things with the consent of the Aboriginal natives of Australia. Uh, that was completely ignored. Terra nullius, basically, at law means land belonging to no one, no one here. So the basis upon which the uh, the occupation, the possession, sorry, the possession of Australia by Cook was a fallacy. Totally legally wrong under English law and international law at the time. Even without Mabo overturning terra nullius, I think it was always questionable in international law. Um, that whole issue of occupation and the legal nexuses that go with it. What we were trying to achieve by going through the Commission on Human Rights and, and to uh, eventually get to the International Court of Justice was to um, open the lie, the international lie, that Australia uh, is a country of people, a democratic country that has been through a decolonisation process. and. and uh, as a result of that decolonisation process, Aboriginal people have also gone through it. And by some magical formula that we don't know, we've consented to the establishment of the Commonwealth of Australia and the states, and that the transfer of our land and territories and water rights uh, were legitimised by some process unbeknownst to us. The fact is we have a bureaucracy which has inherited its original powers from the convict days. It hasn't changed its methods from the, conduct, the convict days. It hasn't changed its attitudes from the convict days. They regard themselves as the public masters, 
not as public servants. So we deliberately, we decided that the way of challenging this would be to challenge not the weakest department of the government, but the strongest. And of course the first thing we found was that there was no such animal. The fact is nobody had ever actually created the taxation department. The constitutional basis on which our money was taken off us was never done. And in October 1999, before the federal court, we actually proved that it had never been done. Here was something which should have been absolutely fundamental. If you or I set up a new company and didn't register it or didn't file the right papers or didn't appoint people the right way, we would be in court and fined. And yet here we have the most influential and important department in the country which had no legal existence. Well, we went into court, so we fought now some nine high court cases numerous cases in other courts and we sought to apply the very simple standard that if the people were being had to obey the law then the taxation officers had to obey the law and we discovered that the courts were not prepared to make taxation officers obey the law the courts were not prepared to say this is not legally done the right way it must be fixed the courts allowed the taxation officers to carry on illegally and in one fell swoop they demonstrated that the true function of the courts was not justice, it was not all of the separations of powers etc which they like to protest is what is their, their true guide, but they were simply uh, a, an executive instrument whose job it was to safeguard the revenue and the money coming in to pay their own salaries. The courts are an instrument of government. They're set up in the constitution as an instrument of government, below they're supposed to be independent. How can you have an independent court, say an independent high court, when the uh, politicians, in particular the prime minister, appoints the judges? How can, he be, how can they be seen to be independent? If an entity is not a legal entity, is that not one and the same as saying that it is an illegal entity? To which the Australian Federal Police, on a transcript tape, which we will be making available shortly on our website, said yes, that is correct. But I think from memory it is the 1899 Crimes Act, currently represented as the 1914 Crimes Act, that actually stipulates that if you interact with, pay or encourage a known illegal entity, it is a seven year jailable offence. And here we have on the website a document stating that the entire Australian taxation office is illegal. The constitution under section 51 gives the government the right to make laws for peace, order and good government. Yet in the Ryan case, in the High Court about two years ago, the High Court ruled that we were not entitled to fair and just tax laws. And that's the statement of the Chief Justice of the High Court. Now, if fair and just tax laws are not orders, are not laws for peace, order and good government, what are? And what people seem to forget is that just about every major revolution in history started on the basis of unjust taxation. Taxation uh, that is based on transactions, whether it's debits or credits or whatever, if it's based uh, on all transactions, without exception, without ex any exclusion, uh, everybody pays an equal amount of tax. So the people who are avoiding tax to a large degree the, the mega corporations, all those people would have to pay their fair share of, fair share of tax. And uh, that's not happening at the moment. Mums and dads pay all the tax. When our tax system was first set up, we had a system which taxed most of the business in this country. Today, most of the business in country is done by overseas 
owned companies who in turn pay their taxes overseas but not in Australia. The result is that you've got to collect more and more of tax from the ordinary taxpayer, from the small man, from the ordinary punter in the streets. And that, of course, gets more and more unfair. Some information has just come to hand, so I should just like to let you quickly know about that. And then... Hi, I'm Dr Mary Ann Gifurian. I'm here tonight because some information has come in to me today that I think you, that you may all be very interested in. Now, a couple of days ago, I received an email, which I think came through Ken's, Ken's newsletter uh, chain, and talking about Ian Henke being jailed. Now, if you know Ian Henke, Ian Henke has been jailed. He's been jailed in Queensland, in Brisbane, and he has four and a half years jail, one year before parole, and the reason he's being jailed has been put up in the Korean Mail on the 30th of March. Now, this is the charge. The charge is that a Supreme Court trial in Brisbane last month, Ian Sidney Hankey, 74, of Hastings, Victoria, and two other men, I won't... Um, anyway, David Houston and Brian Fox, were found guilty of conspiring to defraud the Commonwealth between 1999 and 2001. They were alleged that they were part of a plan to devise, promote or implement a dishonest scheme to strip companies of their assets so they were unable to pay taxes. It was alleged a total of 15 companies took part in the scheme with accounts and, and holdings um, on the Pacific nation of Vanuatu. Now, I won't go into all the details because there is a lot of details and I just printed them off tonight to bring them to you. And also a note appeared in the Australian Government Taxation Office news as well on the 30th of March saying three men today were sentenced to over 11 years combined jail time for their involvement in tax fraud worth 4.5 million. Ian Henke, etc., etc., were promoters of asset stripping and through the use of intricate arrangements. Australia will not stand for these types of illegal scheme arrangements, the Tax Commissioner said. This finding shows scheme promoters that regardless of the type of scheme they use, it will be exposed and justice will be served. Those who participate and pr promote these schemes burden the majority of Australian taxpayers who do the right thing, tax funds vital to the community and government programs relies upon. If you are participating in illegal schemes, Using overseas tax secrecy jurisdictions, it's only a matter of time before we find you. So that's what the taxation office says. Now, what happened to bring about this in reality? Because this is what we read in the media, okay? Ian Henke wins the 2004 court case regarding the illegitimacy of the Australian government. A court case against the Australian government has been won in England which proves the whole system is illegal. Now, how is this possible? There have been a group of Australians that have been pursuing this case for well over a decade or more, perhaps 15 years. Private people, in fact, have put their funds together to try to bring to justice the whole of the Australian people to understand what it is about our government that feels wrong. And these people have gone with their own funds off their own bats to do this. And this is what Ian has been doing for many, many years. Now, what happened? They eventually took it into England. They even had Geoffrey Robinson on the case, Queen's Counsel. They pooled their money and I think they paid about $80,000 for one day of Geoffrey Robinson's time. Now, this is what was handed down. The Master's decision of the British High Court in London last week has been reserved delayed, has been handed down by the end of next month, according to Ian Henke, in April 2004, to bring to an end the abnormalities of the Australian constitution and legal system. Ian believed at that time the likely outcome is for the case to be referred to the full court consisting of Lord Justices and the British High Courts, etc. It means that the Australian Government will have to finish what Australian Prime Minister Billy Hughes started in 1919, a great opportunity to rid ourselves of all the political manipulation of the taxation systems, the courts, and put in place a structure that is run by the people 
and not as it is now run by political parties and their antics and their mates. There should be no disruption. The only people to be inconvenienced will be politicians and bureaucrats. Common law will continue to be enforced and observed by all decent people who for so long have, have seen the tradition of the fair go slip out of their hands. So this is what's happened. And now Ian is in jail and uh, I've been in contact with his wife today and she has written to me tonight, just tonight. By the way, I've known Ian and Fran, his wife, for 25 years. I think what the best idea would be if anyone is interested to follow this through because the very important thing to get out of this is Ian Henke is basically a political prisoner on behalf of all the people of Australia. He's 75 years of age this year in July. He has a heart condition. He's in jail. His pension has been suspended because now why? I guess because now he's a, he's a guest of the Australian government in jail. He's keeping up his spirits. Um, his wife uh, suffered poliomyelitis as a child. She is also partially incapacitated. They do rely on each other for support and love. And she's written a letter now um, to the government virtually begging that he be released. Um, I won't go into this anymore. I think that you've had a beautiful night tonight with this amazing information that I just came in at the last minute to really begin to listen to. What I would do, Ken, is I would, I would, invite, I would invite Frances Henke to come, Ian's wife. She is a journalist. She was, I believe, the... Um, the uh, speechwriter for um, uh, Jeff Kennett, actually, in the days of the Kennett government, and she's a very able speaker in her own right. All right, well, give me the details later and I'll speak to her. But I did promise her that I would come tonight and at least begin to open the discussion about Ian Henke. He is still alive. He is still well. He's been working on all of our behalf for many years. His house was raided during the period that he was doing research. His computers were taken. They were followed by people in vehicles. And, uh, you know, he's really s suffered quite a lot. And, of course, health deteriorates when you are pursued and you are hounded and you are dogged over a long time. When you are trying to research things which, which is just under the radar of virtually everybody else except oneself who's trying to find the thread to truth and grab onto it and then make it so articulate and so real that you can then show it to other people. And that's what he's been doing. Um, my husband said, don't come out tonight, but here I am. And uh, what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is perhaps express your interest either to Ken or write your name down at the end of the room there with Josephine. And uh, what we'll do is we should perhaps begin a community getting together of some intelligence around the subjects that have been pursued. Thank you everybody for your time.